Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. Today's show is about an indie author who isn't that well known outside of a particular circle of readers. At least as far as I know. This guy is a literal rocket scientist from Minnesota. These books could be classified as military fiction, uh, political fiction, they're definitely space opera. And I encountered the first one as part of a promotion. Several of these books, you may notice a theme. I like these promotions, I get a whole bunch of them. I do like to own the book, and so that's part of the reason I participate in these. The series is called The Fall of the Censor by Carl K. Gallagher. The setting of The Fall of the Censor is several centuries in the future when the human diaspora has spread out over several star systems and kind of occupied this whole part of the galaxy, I think. It's a conventional space opera in the sense that man has not changed fundamentally. It's just an extension of our current technologies. You know, things like faster than light travel, anti-gravity, uh, limb regeneration, and so on. There are no alien intelligent races that I'm aware of. It might be interesting to add those later, but this is one of those, kind of like Asimov's books, where the aliens don't really appear if they even exist. Now, the premise here is an encounter between two very different human societies that really are mutually intolerable. <laughs> One is the independent free world of Fiera, and the other is the censorate. It's this vast totalitarian realm that, that occupies many light years of space with hundreds of worlds. We actually don't know because that information is classified. These two Groups of people have lost contact because Fira, the planet, is surrounded by hyperspace shoals. So since you have to go through hyperspace to get anywhere in faster than light, they, they have these storms or sandbars or whatever that, that can sometimes keep you from traveling in a particular direction. So Fira is kind of walled off from the sensor at I assume they have a few worlds in their pocket of the galaxy because they do have spaceships. Otherwise, what would be the point, right? Now, so the two have lost contact for several centuries. Now, these shoals do eventually shift, and at some point they open again so that the Furans can get out. The idea is that these Furans have gone out, they've contacted the censored world, and conflict ensues. Before I go any further, a little bit about the author. Carl K. Gallagher lives in Minnesota. He is a systems engineer working for an aerospace company, so he's literally a rocket scientist, right? He's dealt with satellite orbits and so on, that kind of thing. He was in the Air Force, where he also dealt with this high-tech space stuff, and he has that military knowledge to give a verisimilitude to the military scenes and so on in these books. So he knows the good and the bad, including things like incompetence and bureaucracy and so on. He has written some other space opera books, including the Torch Ship Trilogy. And I had heard of it. I have not read it. All of these particular books, the three of that one, the five so far of this one, have been nominated for the Prometheus Award, which is from the Libertarian Futurist Society. None have won, but it just means that they're all kind of freedom-oriented books. You don't actually have to be a libertarian to be nominated for the books, including there's some, and there's some avowed socialists who have made the list because their books were interesting and had a freedom-type theme. Now, as I said, the hyperspace shoals have shifted. A party of fear and traders have gotten out. They have encountered a censorate world called Corwent. Corwent is an ocean world. They have many islands but no continents and they have a unique culture because of that. They speak a similar language to the Fearans. We don't know if it's English or Esperanto or whatever, but it's diverged, but it's still spelled the same. It's kind of like an understandable dialect. They have an interesting architecture in Corwent. They build these pyramids, pyramid cities, with these blocked blocks of housing that are interconnected called Artles. I think he made up the word. It's a cool word, though. Their people are more homogenous than the Fearans. The Fearans sound like America. They're all these different races and so on. Uh, white people, brown people, black people, etc. Whereas the 
Corwinties seem like they're all brown. They all are like have dark straight hair and so on. Perhaps, well, I think of Indians, South Asians, because they have this weird clan system. And the clans are very important. They are occupationally based clans, much reminiscent of the caste system, except that people do marry out. And so they, people shift between these castes, and they are, well, it's good because it's gen genetic diversity, right? They are ruled by a man called the Censor, who lives on a far-off world. I don't believe he ever appears in this story. He's kind of like this mythical figure, and he may not even exist for all we know. It's a very tyrannical system, but in practice, there are ways that people have found to kind of evade its rule. Kind of like in the old Soviet Union. People had this sum as dot, you know, they had this literature distributed by mimeograph and so on. So it's kind of like that. Now, the censor, its means of ruling is weird. They forbid all information older than a human lifetime. That is, if the author dies, the book is destroyed. Um, the director dies, the movie is destroyed. The artist, the art is destroyed. All that stuff. So, essentially, there's no history. There's no long-lived culture. The censor is free to reinvent it with every generation. And the penalties for preserving old books is very severe. Death. And so... It's like Big Brother in 1984. They're free to reinvent history whenever they please and reshape society. Even hyperspace maps are illegal because they don't want people knowing how to get about. And besides, uh, you know, the author of the map would eventually die and they'd have to destroy it, right? So it's all like word of mouth between navigators. The Furin explorers who end up on Corwin, they are very lucky they happen to meet an historian. Well, that's interesting, because it's an illegal profession. <laughs> it, he's part of a secret society that preserves old books at the risk of their lives. And so they're able to find out right away what the dangers are here. And that's, that's the conflict is born. Now, the Furians see right away that this is a big opportunity for profit. The Corinthians have tech that they don't have, and vice versa. That They're going to trade back and forth and make bucket loads of money, right? At the same time, it's very dangerous. And so, at first, they don't take it quite seriously enough because the censorate, it's got like the worst aspects of the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union with the brutality and bloodthirstiness of the Mongols or the Romans. You think of heads on pikes, they have them. <laughs> and they're a little bit also like the East India Company because they're ruling plants for profit. I hate to throw the British in with this rogues gallery though because. I feel like the British Empire did do some good, unlike the Soviet Union, which, in my view, did very little good at all. <laughs> anyway, the saving grace is that the censorate is, to some degree, bureaucratic and incompetent, well, like the Soviet Union, <laughs> which saved it from being completely unlivable. They are fascists in the sense that they are willing to destroy entire worlds, you know, commit genocide, if a world rebels successfully. They want to profit, but they can't tolerate possibly losing control. So they have destroyed worlds utterly. In fact, they claim to have destroyed Old Earth utterly. And that's a thing they celebrate every year, and everybody's expected to honor that. Although we don't know if that's true, of course. And so Furens, as I said, they are trying to make money off this. They're not necessarily taking this seriously right away, which they should. So there are five books out so far. There are no audiobooks. I have read them all in ebook, and I believe there's hard copies as well, but unfortunately no audio. They are all published by Kelt Haven Press, which is listed as being in Texas, so I assume that's not Carl's own company, but probably a friend of his, because I've never heard of it before otherwise. First out of the five books is called Storm Between the Stars, published in 2020. In this book, uh, we see these explorers. It's Nico Landry and his crew, and they're a, kind of a family. You know, his wife, his kids, and a number of other employees. I don't know, maybe 20 people or so on the crew. I don't remember. And they're doing this hyperspace survey. They find that the shoals have shifted. They, they leave the area and find Corwent. You know, at first it looks like a great opportunity, but then they suddenly realize that, yeah, this is dangerous. <laughs> this is going to be dangerous. So, this is the start of that, the first encounters, the brushes with the censorate and the danger involved, and so on. You know, people start to get killed from this kind of thing, right? 
The second book is Between Home and Ruin, 2021. Now, by this point, uh, the son, Nico's son, Marcus, who is along with, with the crew, he has met and married a local woman called Winnie Goch, or Goch, I'm not sure. <laughs> She's part of a clan, so he's kind of joined her clan as part of the marriage. And I believe they're into, you know, law and administration, although I'm not quite sure, and it doesn't really matter that much. Wayne herself is kind of an interesting occupation. She is a death creditor, which is kind of like a bounty hunter slash detective. It's kind of a private form of law enforcement because the censorate isn't interested in prosecuting murder <laughs> at all unless it's an important person. You know, it seems, hmm, where have I heard that concept before? Oh, let's not bother <laughs> investigating any of these murders at all, you know, depending upon where it's happened. And so, at this point, of course, the censorate has discovered about Fira, and they want to impose their rule and destroy all art and literature, and uh, they are negotiating, but of course there's no negotiating with the censorate because they can't, they can't compromise on the rules-based galactic order, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's part of Nico struggling and the family struggling. What can we do to protect fear? Or what can we do to stave off disaster? This third book is called Seize What's Held Dear, published 2021. When the story opens, we discover that the censorate has attacked fear, has nuked like a dozen cities, there are millions of people dead, and the Fearans have managed to stave them off and keep themselves independent, but they are wanting revenge. And this is going to be difficult because the censor is so darn powerful. Now, Marcus Landry has been stranded here in his old homeworld because he joined the Fear and Space Navy as part of the preparation of defense. And of course, he's separated from his wife and, and child, and he wants to get back to them, he wants to protect them, and he's worried about them. Now, the Fear are supporting the Corinthians who want to break from the censorate now that they know more about what's really happening. They want to become independent and throw off that tyrannical rule, but it's going to be difficult. The fourth book is Captain, Trader, Helmsman, Spy. That is Trader as in Trading. 2022. This one's main character is Nico Landry and his wife also, whose name I forget, <laughs> but they are out exploring in the censorate which is a very dangerous mission. They are trying to get information because the information isn't available. It's all s censored. <laughs> it's all state secrets. So they have to pretend to be loyal subjects of the censorate and just to have be normal merchants and so on. They risk discovery and death and of course torture because the uh, censorate would torture them to find out more about who they work for and so on. So Marcus and Winnie and the other people on Corwent aren't really part of this book. It focuses on Nico, so it's kind of an interesting change. Fifth book, which I've just very recently finished, is called Swim Among the People, 2023. That sounded like a familiar phrase, so I looked it up. Yes, it was by Mao Zedong, the Chinese communist leader. And it refers to a revolutionary, a insurgent, being hidden among the peasant population. And so it's interesting. I, I like how this very pro-American type writer has included this, I know, communist insurgent philosophy because he's well read and he knows a lot about history, right? Anyway, Fura is under threat at this point. They know that the centric is going to come back and try to either rule or destroy them. And the Corwentes have been reconquered after a brief independence. They've been reconquered by the censorate. It was been very brutal. They've like executed all the former Corwenti government, and Marcus Landry is there, and he has to go into hiding, go underground or maybe more appropriately underwater <laughs> on this world, and he has to fight back. He has to try and contact the Fearin Navy so they can coordinate. And he also has to make alliances with shadowy groups on the Corwenti world that we really didn't know about. And so there's a lot about insurgency, and I really enjoyed that bit. 
you know, about trying to fight back without provoking massive retaliation because at some point, at some point, you know, they will just destroy a city from orbit as punishment. They try not to do it too much because they want to make money, but at the same time, they can't allow this uh, group to break free. It's kind of like slaves. Every once in a while, you have to punish one that run, runs away so the others don't do it, right? Pretty gripping, and there's a lot going on in this one. So it's also very interesting. And by the end, yes. Gallagher says, yes, there's another book involving Marcus Landry <laughs> coming out soon. So let's do the pros and cons. The pros. The pacing is great. And there's lots of action. I love it. There's an emotional commitment. You really feel close to Nico and Winnie and, all, and, and Marcus and all these different characters that we grow to know. But as far as the characters, there are also kind of gray areas. That they're not all totally good and they're not all totally bad. Some of the good guys are ruthless. Some of the bad guys have a little bit of a conscience at least. There's some technical plausibility of what happens in this world. It's not completely outlandish. You can tell that, that uh, Gallagher's done his research. He knows the military and, and space, for example, and he also has found out something about climate and hurricanes and how you might um, build structures and cities that are resistant to hurricanes because when you don't have any land to speak of, to obstruct a hurricane, every city is pretty much in danger from that. So it's a great world building because he's really figured out how that might be. He's even diagrammed the way the cities are set up in these weird pyramid shapes. It's pretty cool. As far as the cast is diverse, but they're not the old roles like you would see in your, your progressive book where all the white people or at least where all the villains are white people. No. We've got some villains that are people of color and vice versa. There's also some humor in there. Not laugh out loud funny, but it'll provoke a chuckle or two. For example, the Christians on Corwent, because they don't have a Bible, they make up stuff that they misunderstand, like because of the Herald Angels, they think that God's name is Harold. <laughs> There's also some funny observations on popular movies. How the... Uh, Fieran movies are all about revenge and violence, kind of like John Wick. The Corwentis, they have these weird series about this death creditor called Rag Duffy. And it seems very silly, especially the name and all his adventures, you know, trying to track down the bad guys and so on. Now the cons. First con, the obvious one, the title kind of predicts the ending. And it's, it's not like Star Wars where they say, the Empire Strikes Back. We say, no, the sensor is going to fall. So I found that to be a little off-putting, even though I would have probably guessed that anyway from the thrust of these books. The premise behind the sensor is a little bit implausible. How do you destroy all this old information and rule it all? I guess perhaps the sensor has some exemptions, you know, books that are written by nobody <laughs> and so on. Uh, some of the characters aren't really well developed. It's because it's action-y, you know, because... Marcus has to be a barger and a family man, but he can't have a lot more depth than that, right? The plot often depends upon coincidence and uh, plot armor, that kind of thing, and uh, luck. At some point, the Fierans would probably be captured and killed, but they do narrowly escape. They do find allies. Finally, there's some tropes that are a little bit of a problem, especially with military fiction. There's this issue where you start a novel and the good guys are being routed. It's a disaster. Everybody's being killed. And it turns out, it's a training exercise. <laughs> and Gallagher does do this at, so, at, a point, at some point. And so it's something I've learned to be suspicious of any time this happens in any kind of military-related book. It's a little bit of a problem, but you know, what do you do? Author only has so many things he can work with, right? As far as ratings, all the books were good, I'd say, between four and four and a half gears out of five. Some of them are a little bit better than others, but I'm not going to rate them individually. I did enjoy them all. I would heartily recommend them, especially people who like this kind of adventure stuff. And the, you know, the drawbacks are enough that they won't be solid fives. They're not groundbreaking enough that I would say they're among my favorites, but they are good. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below, whether you have any other similar books you might recommend that I read or review or any topics. You know, maybe I should discuss military fiction in general. I'm starting to get
get a little bit more knowledge about that. I've read a fair number of, of space war books now. Please also like and subscribe because we do want to get out the good steampunk word. I like to have viewers, so maybe I can crowdfund something at some point. I do have some books on Amazon, so check them out. I'll put the links on the description below. Finally, one more thing. I just recently read that Amazon only pays writers for Kindle Unlimited the amount of pages that the person has read. I don't know how true that is. It sounds awful. You know, somebody picks up a book, they borrow it, and they only read one or two pages, so they say, okay, the author gets a tenth of a cent for this. I don't think that's fair at all. So maybe, I wonder if a person could page shoot at the end of the book, would that count as a full read, even if you don't have time to read it? You know, us authors, we are really kind of under the thumb of Amazon at this moment. So anything we can do to prosper, to do a little better, is good, and any help we could get would be appreciated. <laughs> For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.